Three weeks ago, on August 9th, uh, Michael Lorenzen became the 14th pitcher in Philly's history to throw a no-hitter. All right. Yeah, we got some fans here. Yeah. He threw 124 pitches to complete the task. He allowed zero hits, zero runs. He walked four batters, uh, and the Phillies beat the Washington Nationals. He's the first Philly to accomplish this since Cole Hamels did it in 2015 against the Cubs, and he's the first to do it since Roy Halladay did it in 2010 at Citizens Bank Park, which is where the Phillies play their home baseball games. Uh, And so as a, a baseball fan, and specifically as a Phillies fan, as I was watching that game, uh, even on my iPad, because we were painting uh, a room, even on the iPad watching this game, I could feel the excitement building in that stadium. I could feel the excitement in myself building, uh, just watching inning after inning as Michael Lorenzen was getting closer and closer to accomplishing uh, this no-hitter. And I remember the last out, uh, the stadium went wild. Uh, I was yelling. Uh, it's probably, my daughter probably thinks I'm a weirdo uh, for yelling in my house about sports, but I think she'll get there. She's starting to like the Phillies. <laughs> but as incredible as that feat was, um, it was really a 16-second span of his post-game interview that really overshadowed all that he had just accomplished. So I want you to watch this video. 123 pitches. Oh. One more pitch, he's saying. One more pitch. One more pitch. The 3-2 pitch. Swung on, popped up. Shallow center field. Rojas sprinting in. He's under it. He has space. Makes the catch. And Michael Lorenzen has thrown the 14th no-hitter in Philadelphia Phillies history. He is being mobbed by his teammates as the Phillies shut out the Nationals 7-0. The bell never rang so beautifully. so much emotion in one game you know it, when you're pitching balls can land in different places and I just had God's grace today and I definitely got to thank God for today I got to give him all the I mean all the glory just to be able to keep me calm and trusting in him and um, you know whatever happened I was just going to trust in him and that's kind of what I've been doing all season and, and trying to just lean on him and um, yeah I, I just there was a lot of hard hit balls, and thankfully they're to center field, not left or right. Hey, congratulations. Go enjoy it with your teammates yeah, Mike, and your family. Congratulations, you bud. Woo. Appreciate it, guys. Awesome. What an emotional wow. night. So, Michael used one of the biggest moments of his life, his professional career, on one of the biggest platforms meant to showcase personal accomplishment and talent as a vehicle to point, to pe- point people to someone greater than himself. And for many people who previously knew Michael Lorenzen as just a pitcher, he now gave them a glimpse of Michael Lorenzen as someone who's transformed by God's grace and seeks to imitate Christ. And after I saw this post-game interview, it only took me about 30 seconds of a Google search before I was able to find Michael Lorenzen's testimony um, and and to just read his story and, and see the depth of his relationship with Jesus. See, Michael grew up in uh, Southern California in a home surrounded by drug and alcohol abuse. His parents fought constantly to the point where there were cops called to their house basically every weekend. He himself got into drug and alcohol abuse at about the age of 13. And one day when he was in high school, he was getting high with some friends on a pier uh, when a man approached them asking if they had ever heard about Jesus. And this man started sharing his story, his personal testimony. And something took place that day in Michael Lorenzen's life that changed him and changed the direction of his life forever. 
So now while baseball is his profession, his confession is Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life. So I want you to open to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. We're going to look at a few verses here. This might be a familiar scripture to some of you. Uh, This is part of what's known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And there were crowds that were gathering at this time, and, and so Jesus was seeking to kind of separate himself a little bit. And so he went up this mountainside, and uh, the disciples followed him up there, and so he began to teach the disciples. Uh, and so this is what he says to them in Matthew 5, starting at verse 14. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray this morning. Lord, as we gather in this place today, in this house of worship, God, would you speak to us through your word? Would you speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit at work in us? And God, would you help us to push aside the distractions this morning, to hear from you? Lord, as we dive into your word and we dive into what Jesus was teaching this morning, uh, Lord, would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us hearts to receive? And would you give us wisdom and understanding that only you can give? And may you be glorified in this house today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So think about the imagery that Jesus is using He uses the contrast of light and darkness, which is a pretty common theme, especially in the New Testament, right? The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. He's the light. He talks about this being the light of the world. And think about a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. That's a pretty weighty statement for us. If you can picture a city on a hill at night, it's pretty visible even from miles and miles away. When I was in the military, I had a lot of opportunities to fly back and forth across the country into other places. And I always loved flying at night because of being able to see an image like that. Flying over the night sky with the city lights below, it was kind of like a beacon. It was kind of like a waypoint that while there's darkness all around it, there's this beacon of light out of nowhere, letting you know that you're on the right track. And Jesus continued, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. See, Jesus is using pretty common sense phrasing here. You wouldn't turn a lamp on or light a candle and then put something over it and cover it up. First of all, you'd have a pretty big problem on your hands because that would start a fire. But uh, number two, Jesus is really saying, look, the purpose of a lamp is to give light to those around it, not to simply be lit for its own benefit. It's for the benefit of others. It brings light into those dark places so others can see. Then Jesus takes the imagery and he makes application. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So basically, Jesus is saying, you understand this imagery I'm painting for you? Do you get it? Okay, good. Now go and do it. Be the light. And there are a lot of ways that we can be light in dark places. And while the church itself should and is a beacon of light, Um, I want to focus in on our individual responsibility 
of being light. Our words, our actions, our expressions, they say a lot about the kind of light that we carry and whether or not we're keeping that light hidden under a covering or we're giving light to all in the house. And we live in a point in time where the focus is relationships are everything. Life seemingly moves continuously at 100 miles an hour, and the relationships that we have, the relationships that we form, they can bring pause to that commotion. And for me, as a follower of Jesus, I know that not only does my relationship with him bring pause to the commotion, but it brings focus. It keeps me grounded. It provides peace in chaos. It reminds me that my worth is not found in anything on this earth. And the deeper that I go in relationship with Jesus, the more those things become even more heightened in my life. And I hope the same is true for you. It's not simply enough just for me to keep that light to myself. See, there's a a necessity, a great importance then in our relationships to sharing our testimonies. It creates a bridge, creates a connection between you and the other person that you're engaged with. It's a vehicle for sharing the gospel. It shouldn't replace the gospel, but it should seek to point others to the gospel. In a world where people are looking for hope and purpose and worth in dark places, God can and will use your story and your life to draw people into his light. And some of you know me pretty well. Uh, Our lives have been intertwined for some time. Uh, We've connected on deep levels. You know pieces of my life that just don't come up in casual conversation. And some of you know certain things about me very well. If I polled the room this morning, I know the overwhelming majority would know uh, my passion, my deep love for Phillies baseball and Eagles football. And you probably have an idea of some of the other things that really matter to me. Jesus, my wife, my daughter, music. Some of you don't really know me at all. We haven't known each other very long, and so you essentially have a snapshot of who I am most Sunday mornings for about an hour. But the most important thing, regardless of how little or how long you've known me, is that you know my heart. I've shared pieces of my testimony with many of you over the last few years, but many of you who don't know me very well don't know much about who I was before Jesus versus who I am now. And I want to share some of that story today for a few reasons. Number one, to give God the glory for what he's done in my life. And number two, because being able, knowing how, feeling comfortable with sharing our testimony with other people is an extremely powerful tool that God uses through us to speak into the lives of others. And I hope that by sharing this morning, I can encourage some of you to share your story. Pastor Carey, who is uh, the district superintendent of our district, you know, um, I may have said this before, we have about 60 Nazarene churches in what's made up of the Philadelphia district. And we have a district superintendent over all of those churches. That's Pastor Carey Willis. I deeply love and admire and respect him. And, uh, a lot of times he, he poses questions in ways and, he, and the questions themselves that other people either would never dare ask or just didn't feel like they could get away with asking. And Pastor Kerry has this like gentle, loving way of posing this question that really just feels like a thumb kind of pressing into your spine. Uh, and you kind of walk away like, that was a lighthearted challenge. <laughs> and I, I feel oddly like, convicted. Uh, But he asked this question once. He said, in a hundred years, how many people who knew me well will be in hell? In other words, did I light the house 
for others around me to see? Or did I keep that light to myself? See, the truth is, for me, I spent a lot of years believing in God, but living a lifestyle in complete opposition to him. I had a really shallow faith growing up, held loosely together by the weak faith of other people that were in my life. And when the rain came and when the wind blew, I collapsed. And my first few years as a so-called adult uh, were a complete wreck, fooled by partying, irresponsibility, and just outright bad choices. I burned a lot of bridges by being a liar and a thief. And I did not join the military because I was patriotic or wanted to serve my country. I joined the military to escape. I was on a pretty bad path. And I honestly, I'd probably be in jail at some point if it weren't for getting away into the military. And while the military did a lot of good things for me, it didn't change some of the areas of my life that still needed change. I was still constantly jockeying between uh, heavy drinking and partying and shame and regret and rinse and repeat. What else did I have? I believed in God, but I couldn't bring myself to a place where I wanted to stop the destructive things in my life. I was too concerned about fitting in and being a part of the, the, the cool, the majority, the popular crowd of people. I was too busy chasing a lifestyle that was beyond my means. But what I want to share with you this morning what you need to know is that it only takes one moment for God's grace to invade and take root in your life. And so one Easter Sunday morning in 2011, I begrudgingly attended a small church in the middle of a shopping center in Surprise, Arizona. There wasn't anything inherently special about it. There was no bright lights, no pretty dazzling production. Their technology worked about as well as ours did. (laughs) But it was evident that people in that room were different. They were light in dark places. And that's where I was. Until the moment that I heard this question reverberating in my head, during the service. In my head and in my heart, I could just feel the question, do you really want to keep living like this? And I don't remember a single word that Pastor Brian Shaw said that morning, but I do remember the blatant passion on display that he had for his Savior and his desire for others to know that same passion for themselves. And I wanted that too. There's nothing that you'll find at the bottom of a bottle that's going to last long enough to satisfy whatever it is you're looking for. It's only Jesus. And so in the midst of that church service on Easter Sunday morning, God's grace took over and I surrendered my life back to him. The journey since that moment has been beautiful, difficult, exciting, challenging, mournful, hopeful, and joyful. Because the life itself did not get easier. But the decisions that I was faced with did. See, as I grew in my faith and I grew in my relationship with Jesus, and as I continue to grow by the power of his Holy Spirit at work in me, my own desires diminish more and more. And that's really what it's all about. More of him and less of me. C.S. 
See, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Watch this video. You know, the tradition of the early church is that in the tomb of Jesus, which we're, we're not 1,000% where the tomb of Jesus is. You can go to Gordon's uh, Garden. You can, you can go to the um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and I'm sure somebody else has another opinion. And, and somewhere in, in the vicinity is the place where Jesus was put in Joseph's tomb. But the early church fathers knew exactly where the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was. Their, their uncle was there. Their grandmother saw it. They knew exactly the place where Jesus' body was laid. And they knew exactly the place where the stone was rolled away. They knew that Christ had died for the sins of the world, but they knew he was alive by the power of God. And in the tomb, the early church fathers tell us, a candle was kept burning at all times inside the tomb of Jesus. So you didn't need your iPhone light swiped down and on to go in there and check things out and look around. If you walked into that empty tomb, a candle was burning saying, the light has come into the world and even the darkness could not overwhelm the light. And at the, at the celebration of the lighting of the lamps when evening time would come, one of the church leaders would go into the tomb of Jesus. Man, you talk about a worship service. Hello. They would go into the empty tomb of Jesus. They would light a candle from the light burning inside the tomb of Jesus. They would come out of the tomb to the assembly and begin to light the lamps of the worship with the light of the tomb that is empty now where Jesus' body was laid. Can you imagine that? That is the way you start a worship gathering right there. We're all gathered here. It's now evening come. We're all standing in dusk and soon darkness, but out of the empty tomb of the Son of God comes a lighted candle, and now it's lighting my candle and your candle and your lamp and your lamp and your lamp, and now the whole assembly are lamps lit from the light of the empty tomb of Jesus. I could get fired up about that gathering. We have light because you overwhelm the darkness. You are the thread in the story of God that was tungsten filament. You withstood the pressure and glowed into the depths of hell itself. And your light could not be extinguished. And neither can ours. See, the thread was the word of God and is the word of God bringing light to the world. The thread was the person of Christ, the incarnate one bringing light to humanity. And the thread today is the people of God who are now filled with the person of Christ who are now commissioned to be the filament in this day, in this hour, in this city and in our time to be the light of the world. I want my life to be a reflection of this. That I only exist that the Lord would manifest his presence in me. In other words, that I would constantly be his light in the dark places. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Isn't it interesting? He says, I am the light of the world himself. And then he turns to his disciples and he tells them, you are are the light of the world because he wants them to carry that same light with them into the darkness. There was a time where Jesus' ministry was going to end. And if they didn't get that message, if they didn't understand it, there wouldn't be hope. So Jesus told them, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Go and do it. You are the light of Lebanon, Pennsylvania. You are the light of Ephrata, of Denver, of Myerstown, of Jonestown, of Reinholds, of Lidditz, of Mannheim. You are the light. Because Jesus is the light and that light dwells in you. 
if the people around us, if the cities around us are ever going to be illuminated with the light of Jesus, it's going to be through his people. It's going to be through us. You know, my wife recently uh, started a new job working as the the health and guidance secretary for uh, the effort of middle school and intermediate school. And, and so she's been looking for a few items to kind of decorate her, her office space with. And uh, she loves to store fashion sense. Shout out, Julia. Uh, she loves to store fashion sense. Uh, and secretly, so do I. But uh, they still never have enough guy stuff there. But anyway, she, she came home yesterday with this little sign for her office. And I have a picture of it. And it says, the best time for a new beginning is now. You have this moment, this opportunity for a new beginning. You were called to be a light. And if that light does not dwell yet within you, I want you to know that there is a God who loves you, that his grace is greater, that you have worth, that you have purpose, and you have identity far greater than what anything this world could offer you that's found in Jesus. Do you really want to keep living the path that you're on? Or are you ready to embrace the grace of God who loves you, who desires you, and who calls you by name to let his light come into your dark place and to set you on a hill so that you yourself can become a light one that cannot be hidden, that shines in the darkness for others to light up their dark places.